it hurt The following podcast was produced in house for kqek.com. This past week saw the Toronto release of Art Bastard, a lively, informative, and prescient documentary on New York City artist Robert Sinadella. His work is part social and political commentary, folk art, and finely detailed snapshots of observances packed into sprawling, almost cinematic canvases. He's also a survivor of career ups and downs and a natural shit disturber whose paintings and posters provoke and shake up idle minds and steeped complacency. Art Bastard just finished its run at the Hot Docs Ted Rogers Cinema. But just as there is a story behind the artist you've never heard of, there's also a story behind the making of the film, which took roughly a decade to complete. Two names figure prominently in the film's production. Producer Chris Concanon, who commissioned the original project, and Victor Kineski the seasoned editor who directed the film and created a textbook example of a perfectly edited, structured, and paced documentary. Kanevsky's work as an editor isn't initially well-known until you start to drop key names. There's the now-classic documentary Style Wars from 1983, the first film to cover graffiti artists, rap music, and breakdancing, many National Geographic productions, and the classic PBS documentary Benny Goodman, Adventures in the Kingdom of Swing from 1993. But before we talk about how Art Bastard came to be, we're going to start with two films that stand out within his filmography. The aforementioned Style Wars, of which a review is archived at kqek.com, and the cult horror film Ganja and Hess, which forms part of a series of cult horror films edited by Konevsky during the 1970s. That also includes Joel Reed's Bloodbath and Bloodsucking Freaks. Although our discussion could have involved the Reed films, I chose Ganja and Hess because it, like Star Wars, reflects Kineski's acumen for blending aspects of documentary, formal narrative film, and an editing style that served him well for decades. Throughout the middle and end sections of this Q&A, we'll touch upon aspects of Art Bastard's construction, as well as the nuts and bolts of editing, because there is nothing more rewarding than a great cut. No matter how good the cinematography, music, or content may be, It can't gel into a narrative without seamless construction. In looking at your 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 CV, like you've had a really really fascinating career working in a number of genres, and uh, it's just some of the titles that stand out sort of run from all different kinds of genres: documentaries and exploitation films and television productions. Um, I just wonder if you have some thoughts on uh, some of some of the projects that you've worked on. Did any one of them in particular strike well, you? Well, like one that really stands out is Gun Jen Hess, because that's a really unusual film, the way that it was shot, the way that it was cut, the way that it was released as well. It, it's Because it, I think the filmmakers, uh, I, it's been years since I've heard the commentary track on it, but I, I gather the filmmakers, they wanted to purposely make something that was very narratively challenging. Well, <laughs> there was only one filmmaker, basically, the one thing you said that is not right, the other mm-hmm. thing you said is very true about the film, except the way it was distributed. There was no distribution. It was destroyed. The, the history of the film was that when Bill Gunn wrote a script, Bill Gunn was an excellent writer. He won Emmy Awards. He's a very, very unusual man and very talented in many directions. His strength was never as a filmmaker. He wanted to be a filmmaker. He wrote plays mostly. He had done one film which never got released and still has never been released. He always wanted to get it back and ask me to recut it with him, but that never happened. Anyway, so the film was... You want the history of the film? Um, maybe just sort of like your your a concise uh, history of your involvement with the film, because I understand that it did have a very troubled uh, distribution history, and it took years before it finally came out. I think All Day was the first company that put it out, and then later they put a slightly longer version of it on video. Well, the, the first cut was was re-edited and was never released. The, the original cut opened in Cannes to very fine reviews in France came here, played a weekend, pulled, they pulled it, and then recut it, and titled it many, many other titles, which are all exploitation. The original producers just wanted to make money, and thought they could make it through the black market, the blacks, you know, the black market, but the blacks in this country. Uh, they had done one film, which was very successful, and this one was supposed to be an exploitation film, another blacks exploitation film. But Bill Gunn never, as he told me one day, can you imagine somebody hiring me to do a horror film? 
So he, he wrote a horror film, but he had no expectation to ever edit, the, ever direct that film. So he directed his own film, and I got hired. I can't go into that; it goes on and on. And then, then we worked very closely together. And if I hadn't been on this location, I would never have been able to edit the film because it only was by me standing there watching him shoot, get, got the idea of what this film was all about because it was all in his head. There was a script which he would just change automatically anytime he felt like it because that's not the film he had in his head. The lines were not that important. It was the feeling and the emotion that he was getting. And once we started working together, we happened to hit it off where I became his projector. You know, I was able to take from his head and turn it into the film. So that's how it worked. And I would cut and then he would screen once every two weeks. He never walked into the cutting room. Particularly, we went to a screening room. We screened. He would tell me his comments. I'd go back. I'd edit it. We'd go back and forth until the film was finished. And the way it got re-released was a lot of people really thought it was this unusual film. And finally, somebody put together a package, wound up getting all the pieces back, because I had a copy of the film and somebody else had another part of it. And they put the pieces back together again and turned out the original film. And then Spike Lee, of course, decided to copy it, so he just made a version of it, which turned it back into an exploitation kind of thing. Not really, but he mm-hmm. to it. You also so. mentioned that uh, he made a film that never got released. I've forgotten the name of it. Um, it, it, was, it was done for a major studio, mm-hmm. and they didn't, they didn't understand it, and they never released it. So um, I, th- I know the name, but I can't think of it. Were there any major actors in it, or was it sort of another independent in, film? In Bill Gunn's film? Yeah. The original one? Mm-hmm. No, the first one he made, I don't know who was in that. Conjun Hess, you know the actors in that. No, it had a very fine cast. Yes, yes, an excellent. Dwayne, Dwayne Jones, of course, was the, was the, really the only really experienced actor in it. Sam Wayman, who played his second-hand man, was the composer of the film. Mm-hmm. So he was not an he, he was not an actor. He was a he was a fine musician, and of course he had led a band and did that, and he could sing. So he wrote the whole score, and he was one of the actors. Bill was in it himself, and Bill was a very good actor. He had done stage stuff, and Dwayne, and then um, um, well, anyway. Another film that stands out in your filmography is a documentary called Style Wars, which kind of became a, a classic, I guess, for, for a number of reasons, like in terms of capturing the graffiti culture at the time, plus the use of hip-hop music in the film, which was kind of unusual for the time. And um, it's an amazing snapshot of an era that, uh, especially in terms of uh, the way that the city looked at the time, no longer exists. Exactly. Again, it was a film that was started by a still photographer who, when he saw the graffiti, on the trains realized that in his mind it was a really strong art form and so he made friends with all the um, the the writers that's all the kids and then he met another a filmmaker who had done trailers and sort of industrial films tony silva who was at that point was interested in the um, break dancing so they formed together because one was a filmmaker and one wasn't but had the old contacts and they decided to do a film and when they went looking for money and what they had in their mind was to identify this subculture of New York City because it was a subculture and they got a lot of professors together who realized that also and so they wrote a proposal and that's how they raised the money to do a subculture film about the graffiti writers and the rap and the break dancing and of course the rap music followed that because they all had done the rap music even the writers could rap because that was all part of the uh, the subculture so that's how the film got started and one of the problems they had was when they signed their contracts with the music they didn't get the, the right contract so they couldn't release it on video because it would have cost them much too much money because they, nobody wanted to give them a break so it wound up until they could finally raise money, just getting released, getting great reviews, and then disappearing because there was no television at that point back in 1981 or 82. I mean, they weren't showing these kind of films. And I, then I, I ran a little company 
on an editing service, and um, I worked for Tony. I had done trailers for him. I had done one of his industrials. So we got together and we put together the whole package, and I edited along with Sam Pollard, who worked for me at that point, and now he's doing everything in the world. He's terrific. I had a training program that went on for people who were looking to get into film, and um, it was basically opened for black, Hispanic, and women, because way back then, even women weren't really allowed to be in the film business, so they try to keep them out. That, that That's earlier, though. That's I, My career is a long career. I've been editing for 65 years, and I'm still editing, so I'm very proud of that. And this film came up, and I uh, mean, you know, I bastard. I jumped on it and uh, wound up directing it, because I did the whole film. <laughs> You see that policeman with the dog's head, and then the dog with the policeman's head. I was trying to make the point that something was wrong. Bob was really a traditional painter. He understood the basics. George Gross said, there's no such thing as a line in nature. That's all in our head. Pop art came in. It was a whole different world now. Art became something that had nothing to do with reality. My art has a lot to do with the energy of the city. The city was reality. How did the project actually come about? Because you've done documentaries on a variety of subjects, historical, natural, biographical. And um, this one, I guess, must be maybe more involving and perhaps it ended up being a bit more personal as well um basically i approach every film the same way and that is it's not really my film it's the director's film is a vision and if i can understand the vision i can edit the film and any subject it doesn't matter at all to me and i'm looking at it purely from this point of view of a filmmaker i did a film called just crazy about horses and the only reason I mention that, it's a, I happen to think it's a wonderful film, but it never got anywhere because it got destroyed by distributors again. It had good reviews when it opened, but that's another story. Anyway, uh, the little story about that was I worked on it for three months, and I wasn't sure what kind of film we were making. And I was just editing away, and finally I realized it. So I went to the filmmaker, who had, again had never done a film, he had the idea and he had the concept and he had the connections to shoot all these people and all this, all these horses and stuff like that. And I told him the concept and his answer to me was, that's exactly what I wanted to do. And I said, then why didn't you tell me three months ago and we could have been way ahead? He said, because I didn't know. Mm -hmm. And he was a very honest person and he didn't know his concept, but he had it in his head and he was just shooting and shooting. And then once I understood the concept, we finished the film in another three months. Because then I could figure out how all the different pieces would go together to fulfill his vision. And that's the story of Art Bastard. Chris Concanon, who was the producer, decided to do a film about somebody he admired as an artist. So he had to wherewithal to finance a film. And they worked on it for ten years. And he... Um, had one group, they shot a lot of footage, never put together anything, and then he finally had to get rid of them. Then he hired another group, and they almost finished a, a film, and that wasn't anything that he wanted. So he got rid of them, and then he then, like, may have been another one, and then he finally got the last group, and that was a big catastrophe, and she worked forever on it. Uh, when he saw that film, it wasn't the film that he wanted, and it wasn't particularly a good film, so he got rid of them. Jim McDonald, who was the technician and the assistant editor on the film, Chris realized that this was the one person who knew what he was doing. So he kept him, and Jim recommended me, because he had worked for me 20 years ago or something, not as a film editor, but as an office manager and technician. He also had the music background, and he's the one who selected all the music for Art Bastard, and then he edited the music also. So I stepped away from the editing machine and directed the film, and I realized I had so much material shot over 10 years 
that I could make a film and I could try to analyze what this film was about. And it came up to be three different things that I realized had to be in the film. The first filmmaker who made a film just took one of the three, which was his desperation and uh, relationship with the art world, which was just the Sour Grapes film, which was really bad. The next one, the one who finished the film, went back to his background and just really concentrated on the fact of his background and his despising of the art world and never captured him and both films that were made never had his art in it. So they showed pieces of it, but you never felt what the artist was doing. And I have a certain feeling about if you're going to do a film about an artist, you have to show his art. You know, you're not doing you're not doing Rembrandt where everyone knows his art. You're doing a film here where no one knows it, so you want to make sure you see the art. And one of my biggest things is movement on stills. So now I had these paintings, and I realized that the only way to make that move into a motion picture and capturing his personality, his position in the art world, and his art, those are the three things that I thought was the most important things. His background, of course, that's what formed his personality. You know, the, the fact that he was a bastard and the fact that it's haunted him his whole life. The, not the fact that he was a bastard, but the fact that they nobody would admit it. Mm-hmm. that everybody had a lie about it. It was a very psychological study of the, of the two fathers. They were both very happy about being his father, but they, they couldn't admit that one wasn't the father and the other one couldn't admit it because he was a professor mm-hmm. in college. I had a number of things that I wish weren't true. I came to a point where I decided not to be a tragic figure. I didn't graduate from high school. I was illegitimate. But in the end, hey, I have my art. You mentioned all the details in his painting, and that's something that that definitely comes through in the documentary and something that was always striking to me as soon as I saw them because, I mean, you you could argue that his, his paintings also are very cinematic because there are cutaways, there's side characters, there's the physical relationships between the characters in the paintings themselves and sometimes the main characters that are in the foreground they're not really the focus of it because there's all this other material that's going on there and it's just fascinating to look at his paintings because you could just keep looking at little facets of it and like you said you can come up with different stories and different impressions exactly that's exactly you you hit it right on the button and one of the collectors uh, i think i think it was uh, he was a producer for woody allen and he was saying the reason he bought the painting, the one that he bought, was because no matter when he looked at it, he saw something different. It was like a living painting for him. Mm-hmm. It was always something to look at different than what he saw the day before. <laughs> you know, so I thought that was that was pretty pretty wonderful thing for somebody to look at because that's exactly what you said is exactly right. Mm-hmm. Unbelievably, that's that's his style, and the newest one he has is going to blow everybody away. Uh, no one's seen it yet. I've, I saw it when it was in the rough. It's now finished and will be presented in October. It's a major triptych, a big, big mural thing, and it's called End of the World. He makes a, an, a, an interesting point about his work where he says a lot of people find his paintings funny, but when he paints them, he's not trying to be funny. I think my reaction is similar to other people where, like, I'm not laughing at the paintings. I think I'm amused by the wit and the detail and the different perspectives that he applies in the paintings and his characters. And to me, one of the funniest parts of the film is the Santa Claus. Uh, the, 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 was it the, the Santa Claus nailed to a cross? And the fact that it's mentioned in the documentary, and then it kind of just fades into the background, and then it comes up as this amazing punchline towards the end of the film. And the moment he starts talking about how someone asks him, so do you have something that you have for the Christmas season? Um, I'm thinking, oh, no. And of course he's going to pull out the painting. But the fact that he managed to sort of... Everyone knows it in the audience, too. Yeah, and the fact that he just sort of said, no, no, don't worry about it, I'll take care of it. And he slides it into display. (laughs) Right, right. Well, Bob is a natural humorist. It's just his nature to turn things into, into fun. He sees the fun side of almost everything. There's a section, uh, it's one of my favorite sections, where um, he decides to go into the poster business. Right. But he's not just simply selling posters. He's art-directing posters that have a particular 
graphic style to them and the way that the images also accentuate certain political pot shots that he does. It's like it's sort of branding a political statement or a particular jab at a political figure. Well, and, um, he is a very political person. He has an opinion about what goes on in the world around him. And as he says in the film, he, you know, I paint what's around me and I paint from what's happening. And he felt that his art should be telling the story of what the world is about today. And that's his big complaint with the art world is that with abstract art, they're not doing that at all. They're not painting the world around them. They're painting of something else completely. And that was his reason. He said, that's fine if people want to paint that and show it, that's good. But you also have to show other artists who are painting what I consider the art that I'm doing, you know, and I consider that art as well. And they're not showing it. That's what he kept saying in the film. Mm -hmm. which I thought is a wonderful philosophy of attacking the art world without making it sour grapes that he's not part of it. And he's not sour grapes. He just understands that he should be part of it because he is a, an ongoing artist. He's been painting for, what is it now, 50 years or something, and he's still painting. Mm -hmm. uh, this, the end of the world, by the way, I can tell you this because he said it, um, the, the main character in the middle of the painting is Donald Trump. So that's his sense of humor, and he does it in a humorous way because everything he paints has a humor to it. There's another theme that also runs throughout the movie, and that's the topic of mentoring. And it's something that obviously made a huge difference in his life as an artist because he, he had a mentor, and I can't, unfortunately I can't remember uh, the artist's name. Yes, George Grosch. Yeah, who had a profound impact on him. And towards, I guess, the middle part of in Adele's career, he decided, well, you know, I'm going to do the same thing, especially when the opportunity came to teach the same class that he did. <laughs> yeah, right. That was just a, a, funny, a funny coincidence because uh, he had b built his reputation up and they, they knew him from the school. He'd only went to the school, I think, for a year. Uh, I think it was one year. And he walked in just as a kid and uh, George Gross realized he had a talent and he never did any painting with George Gross. It was always just sketches and drawing, because his whole thing about you start out by drawing and then you grow into being a painter. He was supposed to go to Germany and study with him painting, but George Gross died before he got there. Mm -hmm. They had the plan. That's that whole story of him sneaking on board the boat and being a stowaway, which was a very funny story, which almost didn't get in the film. Chris is the one who said, why isn't that in the film? And I said, well, I didn't, hadn't thought about it that much, but I'll revisit it and, and did it and realized it really had that humor and an aspect of it and enabled me to tell the George Gross story. That's the cooperative mentor of the film. Chris would come up with a thought and say, well, why isn't that in the film? And then I would go back and I'd try to find that material because over a 10-year period we had so much stuff, but mostly just words. It was all written because it was all done as interviews. They interviewed Bob incessantly. So, and then, of course, the other people that we managed to get into it, you know, just to just give it some fullness. Are there any significant changes that, to you, have affected the art of editing? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. This gets very technical. When, 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 when film was film, and you're editing on film, you had to follow a process because you first you had to sync up your dailies, meaning get your track in sync with your picture. Nowadays, that happens automatically, but that's just part of it. And then you had to organize everything, because when you started actually cutting with the scissor, you made a cut, and you just couldn't go back and what well, you could later. But when we started, you even had to lose two frames when you had to make a cut. So you had to think a lot before you made a cut. And then even putting things back together, if you cut it in the wrong place, showed when you had your film, so it was difficult to look at until you had the finished film. So there was a process that was done, which was an organizational process. With the computer, you can do the process, but people don't because they've shortchanged the time that's allowed for a film. You don't do a film any faster now because you're editing on a computer, but you can do it faster if you can just knock it off and just do it and it editors have to do that because they're only hired for two or three weeks to do a half hour film where it used to have six weeks but nowadays you gotta do it faster so you just did it but it's not the same kind of film
the films today don't have the meaning that they had back then unless people follow the process. And those who do turn out the films which are just as good because it doesn't matter whether you're cutting on a computer or you're cutting on film. And whatever the equipment is, is not what makes the film. It's what's the thought of the film. And nowadays you, you can do it so quick, so they do because it just gets thrown onto TV and it's not a film. It's just a report usually. But the good films, the, the feature documentaries, which finally, over the last five years, have become accepted in the theatrical world. This year there's 90 or 200 films applied for the Academy Awards in documentaries. And they had to be released in theaters before that could happen. And when I was doing documentaries like Style Wars back in 1980, and before that, uh, I've, I've did two or three other ones. You know, I, I did my first doc feature in, in 66, I think, or 67, yeah. Anyway, um, I go back a long way, so I, I've watched the changes. But anybody who is really a filmmaker has not affected them, because they still go back to the process of shooting the film, looking at your footage, and then and that's all verite now. I mean, it's everybody's shooting verite, but they shoot it badly because they're not sure what they're doing, because they're rushing. Everybody's always rushing to make a film, you know. There's not as much thought as they should be putting into it. But that that's not a, true of the, the good films that are coming out all over the place. One of the questions that I also want to ask you as a filmmaker is that you know, because documentary is so popular, there are a number of options that are available, and certainly one of the options are um, doing the film festival circuit in order to help sort of give your film some profile, a bit of a boost, and then hopefully, I guess, from some some screenings, it helps also makes the film more attractive to buyers and TV stations and distributors. So for your film, did you find that you had to sort of choose between how much time you had to let the film do the festival circuit versus getting it into cinemas because sometimes what happens is a film will play for a year maybe a year and a half in festivals and then finally gets released into cinemas and or comes out on home video and there's, sometimes there can be a substantial gap between when it's done when it goes through the festivals and then when people can finally see it our film, when, when we finished it, we were not scheduling anything, and at the same time, we sent out to festivals, and so the honest truth is we didn't get into many festivals, so it never got into the bigger ones. It got into some small ones. It got into Santa Fe, and it got into Idlewild, and it got great reviews out of the festivals because then it, it won prizes, it won Best Picture, it won Best Director at Idlewild, and then it went to Manchester, England, and it won Best Picture. So it did that little bit, but we had started a distribution, and what happened with the film was that there was a small film group in New York City that screened these films before they're released. They managed to get a couple of theaters that would said they would open the film. Angelica was the big, the big leader of that. They saw the film, liked it, and said, yes, we'll run it. So we had one release in Angelica Theater in New York City. And then this film group, the response to the film, there was about 80 to 100 people in the theater. I was there, and the response was unbelievably good. Uh, I don't know if you know, but it, when it, it ran in about eight, 12 cities around the country in a period of about four or five weeks, just one theater at a time. You know, it's a couple of theaters in different cities at a time, like um, uh, the Lemley Theater in L.A. picked it up, and this picked it up. And the reviews had, on Rotten Tomatoes, it got a 92, and it stayed at 92. It went up to 94 once, and that's where the film is at now. Because in so Toronto, that, it's playing October 14th to the 21st, so it's got yes, a solid I know, week. First city since last summer when it played in Lemley. So yeah, that, that we're very excited about that. That we'll see how how the Toronto audience takes to it. But if they're, if, as you say, that's a documentary town. I didn't realize that. That's wonderful. Yeah, the cinema used to show uh, it was essentially a, a rep cinema. 
then when it went under new ownership, that's when they decided to change the mandate. And everybody was a bit hesitant, thinking, well, you've got a loyal audience with cult films and second-run films. Can it really work as a, as a documentary cinema? But I think what really helped it as well is the fact that they also had the Hot Dogs Film Festival. Yes, and, well, that, that became a very big festival. Yeah, and it's and it, it, I've gone several times to cover stuff. It, it's an amazing festival because the variety of material that you see there was incredible. And part of the, uh, the joys and, and sadness is that you get to see films that you would never see anywhere else, but you also see films that you will never see again because they never find a distributor. And I can think of many films which were very, very striking and... And whether it was a short documentary, whether it was a long-form documentary, they're gone. They're not online. They're yeah. distributors. Like, it's it's amazing. And you always wonder, well, if the film got made and if it played in festivals, surely somebody would be interested in it or somehow the filmmaker might be able to get their film out even just digitally so you could see it. If you go back 20 or 30 years, you, you had no outlet at all, a, a financial outlet. There just wasn't any. So you did these documentaries and they disappeared completely. You could get into a theater for a week and get it shown, you know. I mean, I've, I've had that with some of the films I've made. I've been very, very lucky that I had a little company, which was a combination of doing films, but I really wanted to do independent films. And therefore, my little company, which was an editing service, did many independent films because I used to support them. And I would do other films like National Geographic, which I did. I did the whole Explorer series. And I would use that money to support independent films. And along the way, the only way I was able to do it, which, again, was something I wanted to do, but I didn't know how, was to train people in the film industry because I was very upset that when I realized that blacks were not allowed in, to, in the film business, and I went along with the whole thing about women before that, which I didn't understand why they weren't in the film business. And so I did a training program, and what I wound up with was the most talented young people in the city. And I'm never quite sure if I'm going to be recognized as a mentor to all of these filmmakers or the work that I personally did with these filmmakers, because I worked with them, we co-edited, because I would bring them on, and that's how they trained. And the list that of people who have trained for me is incredible, because they've gone on to win Academy Awards, they've gone on to be the, probably the best documentary filmmaker in the country today. Sam Pollard was one of my protégés, and so was Ross Kaufman, and... Uh, but also because I did independent films, I did some very unusual movies, and I'm very proud of the fact that I think I have five cult films that I've been personally responsible for, as well as the filmmaker, because it's always a collaboration. You don't go out to make a cult film. Nobody says, I'm going to make a cult film. You go out and you do a film because you want to make a film, and then somehow an audience picks up on it, and years and years later, it becomes a cult film. And that was Style Wars, that was Ganjin Hess, and that was, uh, uh, the other ones were uh, Our Latin Thing, which was the first really, it was more than a concert film, but it started out as only a concert film on Latin music, salsa music that was done in the early 70s. And then the horror films, because I also did horror films, because I had to earn a living. And uh, a couple of horror films became cult films. My next to last question is that, uh, you know, in examining Senadel's career, for yourself, do you find it's more creative rewarding to be an outsider, as opposed to being part of an established Hollywood system? Oh, you mean me as an outsider? Mm-hmm. Um, like, do you find that, I for think, example, your career has been far more richer and made a greater impact in being outside of the Hollywood system, for example? Yeah, well, I don't know, since I was never in the Hollywood system. I've sort of done a lot of stuff with more significant than Hollywood films, it's hard to say. A lot of the filmmakers who, who started with me, and when I say trained them, they came to me as apprentices and left me as full editors and some of the best editors. So they they stayed one they, one of them stayed with me for 24 years, and now she's editing elsewhere because I went out of business. And Sam Pollard used to come and go in and out of my place, 
And uh, you, I, I assume you know who Sam Pollard is, or so maybe you don't, but you will. <laughs> anyway, um, and one day I asked him, I said, Sam, why do you keep coming back to Valken, that's the name of my company, when when you, I know you work harder here than you work anywhere else, and I, know, I also know that you get paid at least half of what you get when you work outside, which is all true. And he, the answer to me was, well, you do the hardest films, and that's what I want to learn how to do. And today he's a full professor at NYU and doing the hardest films that anybody does in the country. And um, he's got one now that's going to be released this year, which is going to be a wonderful film So when it comes out. Mm -hmm. Anyway, um, and then Ross did uh, Born into Brothels, which won the Academy Award. I've had a film nominated for an Academy Award with another editor who is now doing another big project so so what i've what i got was able to do was which i give give great pride in was the people who have trained with me and have agreed with my sort of uh, mentality of what the world is about and what film could be doing have done it and uh, i've succeeded in the films that we talked about which were unusual films I think um, Art Bastard is, you know, an, an extraordinary film, especially for me in seeing the way that it was structured and edited, because its pacing is razor tight, and uh, certainly from from what we've been discussing, the way that you took aspects of his life and allow them to kind of flow through and then eventually you know there were certain things that you accentuated and certain things that you reeled back on but there was a very nice balance between everything so i think you're right in the way that you say that certain things that could have been emphasized would have taken away from other things so it's it's very much a film about balance about uh about the wit of of the subject and uh, also about his art his amazing art and i think it's a great testament to the fine work Thank that he's so done much. and you've worked a great on. compliment which you just gave to me Pacing is the is the editing process. I mean, the whole idea of filmmaking, you know, the two art forms, I mean, the two major art forms that are the same, is film editing and music. And the two blend together. And one of the reasons Art Bastard is so successful is because we, Jim and I, and mostly Jim, really decided to do an eclectic music score. So the music was not done to tie the film together, the music was done to create the mood for each sequence or really to each painting. And as we were working, we realized we wanted some real breaks and just let the music carry it. So we found songs which which were in keeping with the art of what he was trying to say, we felt, and that's the music that we selected. But Jim really did the selection and I did work with him on it. I worked with him on everything. But as I say, I acted as the director and he acted as the editor. But we edited together. I mean, that's the way I used to do it when I was the editor. Mm -hmm. So some of the films, when I finished them, I asked to have co-director credit, which they belligerently gave to me on a couple of films. But it didn't really matter because the films were directed in the cutting room. And, of course, the directors were there, some of them, and some of them weren't there. But it didn't matter. It was their vision. That gets it. The credit for for Art Bastard really goes to Chris Concanon because he would not stop until the film was what he envisioned as a film. Special thanks to Victor Kanevsky for his generous time and candor, and Sonia William at the Hot Docs Ted Rogers Cinema, and Ingrid Hamilton at GAT for facilitating the interview. You can follow KQEK.com's reviews and interviews via our Facebook page and Twitter updates via Mondo Mark underscore KQEK. This podcast was produced by Big Head Amusements and is copyrighted 2016 by Mark R. Hassan. Mediocrity deciding the fate of genius. It had to do with money. I was getting a lot of my anger out. In the 60s, I made a target. This is propaganda. Artist Robert C. Nadella has sparked quite a controversy in New York City. Bob's a pain in the ass. That's why I'm doing this right now, because Bob's a pain in the ass. They would never show Bob stuff. There's just too many thoughtful things going on. And we live in a society that doesn't like to think. 
Money and art have nothing to do with each other. You can bastardize everything else in your life, but if you compromise with your art, why, why be an artist?